And we are recording. All right, here we go. Hey, everybody, how is it going? I am Jay Bear, pumped to have you with us on this special zombie apocalypse <laughs> webinar, how to create conversations with multi-channel marketing. Really excited that you're taking some time with us. I know there's a lot going on in the world uh, right now, and we're happy to spend a little of that time uh, with you in this special session. Uh, we've got a very special guest uh, as well with us, and, and uh, uh, Kristen Cardos also from Convince and Convert is going to be moderating any of your uh, questions. If you, if you don't hear anything, don't see anything, whatever, uh, put it into uh, the Q&A or the chat function, and uh, we will get you all squared away. Give everybody just another minute or so to log in. Sometimes you got to you know, download a control or something before you can uh, see the webinar. So we like to start a couple minutes past the hour just to accommodate some of that Tom foolery. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. We got some research, we got some stories, uh, we got some giveaways. It's going to be a blast. We got some interactive polls. Man, I am uh, I'm fired up uh, for you guys to be here. Uh, Chris and I see some uh, people uh, jumping into the comments stream. Uh, any questions that uh, we should be paying attention to at this point? No questions yet, but I'm sure they're coming. Okay. Yeah, I see some, uh, some people in the chat there saying hello, and people can hear me, people calling in from North Carolina. Uh, we were just talking about North Carolina, uh, both uh, Kristen, uh, who is moderating this uh, webinar today, and the one, the only Jason Yarbrough, also from North Carolina. So the Tar Heels representing here on the webinar. As mentioned, I am Jay Bear, founder of Convince to Convert, best-selling author of one, two, three, four, five, six books, Hall of Fame keynote speaker, and notable wearer of plaid. I am joined by my very good friend, a champion axe thrower, and that's no joke. He is Jason Yarbrough, Director of Strategic Alliances at PFL, a thought leader in tech-dial marketing and collaborate with lots of marketing partners globally. Yarby, my man, welcome. Tell everybody about yourself and PFL. Jay, wonderful to be here with you. It's been a while since we've done something together. I think like the social fresh days, so excited to be back playing with you on the, uh, the internets again. But <clears throat> yeah, Yarby, as Jay said, axe thrower, I guess. I have a trophy on my desk where Jay and I went to head-to-head in a championship axe throwing competition. And fortunately I won, but I am the director of strategic alliances here at PFL. I mean, I work with all of our referral partners, tech partners and platform partners like Salesforce, Marketo and Oracle. And what PFL is, is we are a automated direct mail solution that allows you to coordinate your direct mail and digital marketing efforts intelligently and super simply. Uh, we deliver remarkable brand experiences, uh, remarkable being a key word to today's topic. Uh, excited to be here to talk to you guys about some of these stories and work that we do at PFL and how it affects what you're doing in marketing and make you more memorable. Just to make sure everybody knows how to use the chat function, uh, go ahead and put a yes or no in the chat. If you would sit in on a webinar that was only video of Yarby and I going head to head in an axe throwing competition. <laughs> I think I've got video or pictures of that somewhere. <laughs> We have a we have a pretty strong uh, pretty strong opinion on yes. I've only seen a couple a couple of no's. Those people are probably three. Paul's not into it. Uh, people who are in risk management probably are are, uh, are anti that. Uh, uh, Jen also not down with it. Understand Jen not ho not going to hold it against you. Uh, but but many people interested. So next time we're working on this, let's let's think about that. I'm sure we could put. I mean, it if there. if this is the zombie apocalypse, we better be prepared by being able to throw some camp axes and stuff. Everybody needs an axe. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. A couple other notes before we begin. In addition to uh, axe throwing uh, webinar teases, uh, one, yeah, uh, we are we are absolutely uh, recording this. So if you want to come back and look at some of the things that we've mentioned. You want to share it with other people on your team. That's spectacular. Second. Yeah, we're going to send you the recording uh, via email. Um, also, we are going to take questions at the end. Uh, you can either use the chat function, which many of you are now familiar with, or the actual Q&A function, which is more specifically designed for questions. We'll, we'll, we'll handle both of those, kind of your preference. But important note, there are going to be prizes. So particularly good prizes um, for particularly good questions. Uh, copies of my book, Talk Triggers, is all about uh, word of mouth, brought to you by PFL. Absolutely. Excellent book. Thank you, sir. Look, we're all trying to accomplish our marketing goals, and it's become even more uh, important here in the last few days. But one of the things I've, I've concluded over my long uh, career now in marketing, which is almost 30 years, is that 
when, when we're up against the wall, when our boss is saying, hey, where are the leads and we need more revenue or whatever, our, our tendency, and this doesn't make anybody a bad marketer or a bad person, it's just human nature, our tendency is to push a little harder. And, and here's how that feels in many cases to our customers and prospects. Howdy y'all, this here's Mike. Down at Mike's Golf Shop, where we buy golf. That's right, we buy golf clubs. Mike's Golf Shop. Come on over here, we buy golf clubs. Over at Mike's Golf Shop. Come on down here, we buy golf clubs. That's right, we buy golf clubs. 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 <laughs> That's the, he's the pride of Tennessee, Yarby. Uh, that, that guy is, uh, is, is pretty epic. Uh, yeah, I would say, I would say A for message consistency, right? I mean, there is, there's very little ambiguity uh, about what they buy, but I would argue uh, lower marks uh, for, for subtlety. And, and sometimes when we try to go after our prospects, it, it sort of feels like that. It sort of feels kind of up, uh, kind of up in your face. And so we're going to try and avoid that a little bit. And I got to tell you, one of my favorite quotes in business is from Robert Stevens. Robert is the founder of Geek Squad, the services arm for Best Buy. I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with Geek Squad. And Robert once said that advertising is a tax paid by the unremarkable. Now, that, it's not 100% true. Uh, there is a time and a place for advertising, but, but I think it is largely true and also true that, that many of the most successful organizations in the world spend the least on advertising because their customers will do that for them. I'll tell you this, the, the best way to grow any business, PFL, convince and convert, your business is uh, dialing in for today's session. The best way to grow any business is for your customers to do it for you. In fact, word of mouth influences 50%, 50% of all purchases, but it, but it doesn't happen naturally. We'll talk about that here today. 50% of all purchases, but as, as you probably know, PFL does a lot of work in, in B2B, as does uh, my firm Convince and Convert. And word of mouth influences an even greater share of purchases on the B2B side. Let's find out uh, just how much and let's see how much our audience, Yarby, really understands the power of word of mouth for B2B. We're going to do a little poll, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to launch this for you. And right. A little moment of truth. Moment of truth. Um, there we go. Uh, hopefully you all see that. What percentage of B2B purchases are influenced by word of mouth? Is it 62%, 83%, or 91%? Great participation from the attendees. Thank you all very much. The winner is going to get an ax um, from, from PFL. It's great. Custom branded ax. It's very Montana-esque. Yeah, it is. It appears that the results are in. And here they are. You all said, 58% of you said 83%. A quarter of you said 91%. 17% of you said 62%. Yarby, uh, do you know the answer to this? Uh, I, I do, actually, yes. Why don't you tell the audience what it is? Well, you guys were close and you were close. Some of you were right. It's 91%. 91%. Almost everybody who is in a B2B purchase scenario will rely at least in part on word of mouth. There's a couple of reasons for that, why, why B2B word of mouth is more important than, than B2C. One, uh, usually the downside of making a poor decision in B2B is higher, right? It's a greater investment. Uh, you know, if you buy a bad piece of licorice, like you're going to survive. But if you, if you buy a bad CRM system, you're going to screw a bunch of stuff up, right? So people are going to rely on the opinions of others, whether it's online or offline. 
And also you don't typically buy as many things on the B2B side. So you're, you're more careful and considered in those purchases as well. So 91% of B2B purchase. And we also, yeah, we also find that the larger the purchase, the more word of mouth impacts buying decisions, which, which stands to reason, right? That, that uh, you're going to trust other people, presumably who have had experience with that product or service uh, before making a purchase. Now, we have one more poll question uh, for you all today. This one I love because I will tell you, um, well, I'll tell you later, uh, but I'll tell you why I love this one. Which generation is most impacted by word of mouth when making purchases? And what I mean by that is which generation relies upon word of mouth most heavily when they, when they buy something, okay? Is it those pesky millennials? Is it uh, Gen X, which I think is Yarby and myself. Do you, uh, do you classify as a millennial or a Gen X, Yarby? Gen X, my good man. Attaboy, attaboy. Uh, and, then, uh, and then baby boomers. So let me launch the actual poll here. There we go. Which generation is most impacted by word of mouth when making purchases? Let us know what you think, y'all. Need some poll music. Uh, we do need poll music. That's a good idea. Next time. We need like a keyboard accompaniment on, on, this, uh, on this deal. I'll come better prepared next time. It looks like the votes are in. We'll share the results. I have done this poll question uh, in, in live keynote presentations and other circumstances, I don't know, probably 10 times. And the results have been exactly the same uh, as I should say the results are always different. Um, this is the first audience that's ever gotten this correct. Uh, in, in every other uh, time I've ever done this question, uh, the audience has said baby boomers uh, this particular audience, because they are very, very intelligent and wise, correctly said that millennials uh, rely more on word of mouth than any other generation. And you are correct. At least 60% of you uh, are correct. It is, in fact, millennials. And although it wasn't on the slide, um, it's even more so for Gen Z. So it's actually a ladder approach, stair-step approach. So the younger you are, the more word of mouth impacts your purchasing decisions. Hmm. So, so Gen Z is more than millennials, millennials more than X, X more than boomers. And, and we're not certain uh, based on the research exactly why that's true. But the assumption is that as you get older, you become more comfortable in your own wisdom and your own ability to discern good from, from mediocre. And so you don't feel like you need to rely on other people quite as much. However, let me reemphasize, even amongst boomers, right? Word of mouth is still massively important, right? It's still 50% of all purchases, 91% of, of all B2B purchases, but amongst younger people, it's even more critical. Uh, and of course, even if you're in a business where millennials or, or Gen Z are not your core target audience today, they will be eventually. That's just how the aging process works, yeah? So we have determined uh, with your assistance, uh, that word of mouth is super important. But here's the part that's crazy. Fewer than 1% of all businesses have a strategy for creating word of mouth. We just take it for granted, right? We just assume that if we run a good business, customers will talk about it. But the reality is different. Competency doesn't create conversations. Nobody ever says, Yarby, hey, man, let me tell you about this experience. Um, it was perfectly adequate. Haven't heard right. that. ever says that, right? That's a, that's a bad story to tell. It's a bad story to hear, right? So there's got to be something else. We have to understand that that same is lame. And regardless of what business you're in, your prospects will discuss things that are different and ignore things that are average. And you can, in fact, be different just in how you go to market, in the ways, the tactics, the things that you use to get attention, that in and of itself can be different. And that's what Yarby and I want to talk to you about today. Five imperatives, one, two, three, four, five, for creating multi-channel marketing conversations. And we're going to show you some, some interesting stuff that is drawn from this report. Yarby, tell them about it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so talk about multi-channel marketing. And I think to, to really better understand the importance of multi-channel marketing and the power of what we preach here at PFL being uh, intentional and coordinating marketing efforts. Uh, we, we worked with Demand Metric. We partnered with those guys to research on how marketers are using the strategy and how to analyze the indicators that signal higher overall performance. And we'll look at some of those signals here in a little bit. Uh, 
and what the three most effective channels reaching your audience might be. And what we found is that direct mail is anything but old school or dead, right? We hear that a lot, direct mail is dead, but we found it be quite the opposite. And while it's not exactly a new strategy, there's a lot of new strategy around this deployment. Uh, and this, this learning is super impactful for marketers. And, and that's what we're here to share with you today. And lots of lots of numbers from this report. You bet, thanks. Uh, first thing of the five is that your marketing must be remarkable in the true definition of that word, which is worthy of remark. It has to be a story worth telling. And one of the things that was really interesting in this report that, uh, that Yarby mentioned is, is that the, the chart you see in front of you are the percentage of survey respondents who are actively using each of these marketing tactics, right? So 91% of the attend of the, um, uh, participants are, are using email, 81% using social, and, and you can see on down the line. So if you're trying to get your customers to talk about you, if you're trying to get them to engage in word of mouth, if you're trying to, to turn your marketing uh, into sort of a messaging advantage, it sure seems to me that I would want to try to emphasize farther down this list, right? I, I would want to say, well, how can I zig when others are zagging? What, what marketing tactics can I engage in that I know my competition is less likely to also be engaging in? If you look at this research, it's things like content syndication, uh, actually outbound sales, amazingly, um, search marketing and, and uh, related uh, opportunities and direct mail, right? I mean, 56% of this group is using direct mail, which means that 44% aren't. And I think that's a huge opportunity. Uh, you'll see that in this example that uh, Jason's gonna take you through right now. Thanks. So yeah, if I think, you know, according to talk traders, uh, remarkable by definition is a story worth telling. All right, so I've got one for you. Time trades, one of my favorite stories from PFL worth telling. And time trades, an online appointment scheduler for those that don't know. Uh, some of their challenges, as you'll see, was difficulty breaking into target accounts. Uh, they had a uh, target account ABM running, account based marketing for those not familiar, but they really weren't getting the results they wanted. So emails weren't being opened, calls were being ignored, and their direct mail strategy was more sporadic than it was strategic. All right, but, but they had their aha moment when a really influential package arrived on their, their VP of marketing's desk. So right, an engaging direct mail piece was, was going to be their talk trigger after she got this piece put in her hands. And it, it became a big talk trigger for a lot of their prospects and customers. So they came to us, PFL, uh, to incorporate their direct mail uh, into a multi-channel program. And what they did was they utilized golf theme packages. Right, they, their, their audience, they, they kind of did some research, found some, that a lot of it were men that they were targeting, golfers probably. So they went after a golf theme package, as you see here. Um, but I love the way they did this, this, this campaign in particular, right? They did it by targeting multiple personas. So what they had was a separate kit for champions. So maybe like AEs, BDRs, marketing associates, so on and so forth. And then a separate kit for the executives that they were trying to reach. And because they were using our Swag IQ solution, they were able to send relevant messaging to each persona. So the, the champions got one piece of messaging and the executives got another piece of messaging and a personalized note from the rep that was targeting them. So the goal here, it was to put, to get the, uh, to get the two personas talking to one another. So get the champions talking to the executive and the executives talking to the champion. And so what went out to the champions was that box of golf balls that you see there and to the executive went the putting mat that you see below. And their, their call to action, the call to action was book a meeting and we'll send you the putter to go along with this, right? So each of them are talking about what they got and how they want to utilize it, what they know about time trade, why they need time trade, how to use it. And they got some pretty great results, as you can see here, right? They got a two and a half X, their average sales price. They had 300 plus new opportunities generated and a 25% conversion rate which if you're doing math at home, those are all really good numbers. It's so cool. And I, and I just, I love the putting mat. I mean, that's such an interesting thing. You know, you, you think about um, not only using a tactic that customers wouldn't expect, direct mail, but, but also something that, you know, you just, you know, I've, I've got a lot of coffee mugs, right? I got a lot of other things that right. have been sent to me in the past, but putting mat is not on that list. Uh, so I love the creativity there and it definitely, it definitely breaks through. Nice one. Yep. Strategic operational differentiator if we're talking talk triggers. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Uh, second uh, part is that marketing must be rotating, rotating. And, and really interesting in the, in the report, it showed that 
half of the study participants are, are using between uh, three and four marketing uh, channels. Uh, and about 30% are using five or more. Uh, we didn't have a poll on this because you, know, you guys are all from different types of companies and stuff, but I want you to just take a second and think about how many different channels you are using, kind of go back to this chart, right? How many of these uh, are, are, are you using? Probably not so much events, at least not in the uh, near future, but how many of these are you actually engaged in uh, today? I'm just gonna look at myself and see. For me, it'd be one, two, three, four, five, all of them. Uh, for me, it's all of them, but you know, that's kind we're, of what- We're we seven. Do. You guys are seven, right? So um, the preponderance of, of people who participated in the survey, which I think is representative of most of us, are, are three or, or four, which even that is a lot. And it's, it's wise. I would say more is better because there's a reason why we call it a, a marketing mix, right? especially if you have some sort of an advantage, you want to make sure that people understand that advantage all the, all the places. You want to surround them with, with messaging. One of my favorite examples, a couple of you have heard me talk about this before, is a, a theme park located not, not far from uh, my home here in Indiana. It's called Holiday World and Splash and Safari. It's, it's interesting. It's, it's a family business, a longstanding family business, been named Theme Park of the Year by the Theme Park Exhibitors Association. And that's a little unusual because, you know, they are a family business. It's not Disney or, or Universal Studios or whatever. Uh, and it's called Holiday World because they don't have Harry Potter or Spider-Man. They've got Christmas Land and, and Halloween Land and Thanksgiving Land with like free gravy. It's, it's, a little, it's a little unusual for sure. But one of the things that they are known for from a marketing standpoint is free soft drinks. So when you go to Holiday World and Splash and Safari, you get a little cup and there's 73, I think is the current number, um, uh, little little huts around the, the complex. And in each of those, you can go in there with your cup and get as much Coke, Diet Coke, Pepsi, Diet Pepsi, Sprite, whatever, uh, Gatorade, lemonade, iced tea, they got it all. And it costs you nothing. Now, if you've been to a theme park or a baseball game for that matter, any time in the last five years, uh, you'd be like, well, isn't it usually $37.50 for, you know, a Coke Zero? Yeah, that's usually the way it is. It's a huge profit center. But these guys are like, no, nah, we're just going to do it for free. So that's great. That is by definition talkable. But what's really smart is they always remind you of it, right? So here's a print ad. Uh, and you can see if you go to the bottom, free soft drinks, also free parking and free sunscreen, which is pretty dope as well. Here is their Twitter page. Right there, free soft drinks as well. Their outdoor boards, their radio commercials, all of these different things in the marketing mix uh, always mention kind of their core differentiator, which is free soft drinks, right? It is really, really smart. I think too often we have a differentiator and then we talk about it in one place or, or every once in a while uh, and, and you've got to push it more consistently. Great question from Dexter. Is there ever a, such a thing as too many channels at once? How much is too much? I, I would answer it this way, Dexter. You can have too many channels if by supporting all those channels, it waters down your messaging. Does that make sense, right? So if you can have consistent messaging that is relevant and meaningful uh, and spread that messaging across every channel, great. If you have so many channels that the message gets, gets wishy-washy or lost, then you probably have too many. Jason, do you agree? Totally agree. It also depends on like how many resources you have as far as a team that can carry all this out. If you start overwhelming yourself with, you know, too many channels, then you've got too many. Yeah, I, I feel like um, in general, I'm not necessarily the best practitioner of this because I feel like I've got to, because I'm a marketing consultant, I have to know enough to be dangerous about all the things, uh, which is one of the reasons why there's not too many rocks that, that I won't overturn eventually, just out of general sort of anthropological purposes. But in general, I think people would be wise to to um, don't add another channel or tactic uh, unless you really understand why and how it fits into the ones you've already launched, right? right? So yes, we do want a marketing mix, but but more is not necessarily better. More is better if you can keep the quality the same. Third thing, uh, marketing must, must be repeated. And anybody who's actually spent any time in actual sales, this will be very familiar with them, but repetition creates conversation. In the report that PFL did, um, they found that the best way, uh, you see that sort of third group of, of circles there on your screen, the best way 
uh, to reach prospects, uh, unless they're C-suite, is with more frequent repeated messages on a regular basis, daily, weekly, monthly, right? So it is very unlikely that you are going to be able to sell something based on one message or one touch. You know, every once in a while that happens, but generally speaking, it doesn't. That's why the whole idea of, of lead nurture is so important. And this research really bears this out, right? So in, in almost every case, again, unless you're a C-suite who tend to get um, maybe annoyed by repeated messages, consistency actually uh, actually works. On, this, on the C seat why C, that's hard to say, C suite side, um, you can see on the far left-hand side what works best for them are messages that are triggered based on need, right? So C-suite does a thing, asks for a thing, behaves in some way that indicates a specific need, and then you follow up on that. It's more of a transactional marketing mix as opposed to uh, a consistent informational marketing mix to answer uh, Samantha's question uh, in, in the chat. Some of you are familiar with Doubletree Hotels. Doubletree has been giving out a warm chocolate chip cookie to all their guests every day in every hotel worldwide for 30 years. 30 years. Today, tomorrow, the next day, they will give out approximately 75,000 cookies uh, per, per day, which is a whole bunch of cookies. A lot of cookies. And, and it's a lot of cookies. And what's interesting about that is, is this frequency, right? It's not like a promotion or like the McRib, right? Where they're going to do it for a little while, then pull it back. Uh, or, hey, you only get cookies if you're in the Hilton Honors Program, or you only get cookies if you stayed at that hotel in the past, or you only get cookies if you're looking a little skinny. Like everybody gets a cookie every time, right? And even if you know the cookie is coming, they still give you a cookie, right? And there's a lot of wisdom to that level of consistency. And I think we can all uh, learn a lot from that. I mean, don't you guys at PFL advise your clients to do that? Like, hey, don't just think you're going to send out one dope uh, direct mail piece and all your problems are solved. Right. Yeah, we, we encourage it actually building your list of target accounts, not just sending one piece because one piece isn't really the thing that works, but it's that, that piece. And as we'll look at a little bit later, it's actually sending one, two, maybe three pieces to the same you know, prospect and warming them up with different pieces. Yeah, no doubt. Marketing must also be rational. And, and this is, I think, a critical point. Yes, we, we want to create conversations with our marketing. And that's why we've all gathered here today. And again, thanks for your time, guys. But this isn't about going viral, right? This isn't about a stunt. This isn't about creating conversation for conversation's sake because you can't pay your rent with chatter. Uh, trust me on that. So you, you have to have conversations in word of mouth that generates prospect behavior that eventually yields successful sales outcomes, right? So if you just want to create conversations, go rent an elephant. Rent an elephant and shoot a TikTok video of you riding the elephant and saying, we buy golf clubs and, and your work is done, right? That's not marketing, right? That is a public relations stunt, different thing. So in this case, what we're looking for is saying, all right, if we, if we have a sense of who we're trying to go after, what types of marketing activities are most relevant to that group? And in this research, we found, for example, if you look at display ads, right, which in this case um, would be things like uh, online uh, banner ads, et cetera. Um, if you look at um, the top line, which are end users, right? So those are users of products and services, 72% of the time that is deemed to be effective. But if you look at the C-suite, only 32% of that time is that deemed to be effective, right? So understanding the persona, if you will, the use case of the, of the prospects that you're trying to reach, and then thinking about, all right, what type of marketing do they actually utilize and want can save you a lot of time, money, and heartache. Uh, similarly, if you look at uh, technical audiences, which is the fourth, the sort of the light gray or light blue uh, circles on your screen, amongst technical audiences, 80% of the time, events are deemed to be effective. Only 40% of the time is social media deemed to be effective for technical audiences, right? So if you're in a, a B2B uh, technology company, uh, maybe uh, social media isn't necessarily going to be the best play, or at least not as a, as a primary method, maybe a helper monkey, if you will, 
uh, but events uh, a huge play. And that's why obviously it's kind of tragic. We've had to cancel so many or postpone so many big B2B technology events because it really, really works for, for all sides of the ecosystem. Yeah, and, and one of the things that we saw in our report is that events were actually the number one most effective channel by the entire group surveyed. And now that's been taken off the table. The second most effective was actually direct mail in the group that was surveyed. Yep, second most effective. So I guess if, you, if the first most effective is not available today, uh, right. direct mail would be the next best thing. Speaking of direct mail, um, this is a personal example. I'm actually not any good at beer pong because it was invented after I was out of college. So it, I, I predate beer pong, which I know is, uh, is a sad statement. Um, but my buddy, Paul, owns this company, Sarge Rentals, here in Bloomington, Indiana, home of Indiana University. Uh, and he has tons and tons of houses and apartments that they rent to students under the Sarge Rentals brand. When somebody, a student, uh, rents, probably with like 15 friends, uh, one of their houses or apartments, Sarge Rentals mails to them this package of custom beer pong cups and a whole pack of balls as well with the Sarge Rentals logo, which I think is talking about knowing your audience, right? And, and, and understanding uh, who, who you are trying to reach. And then, you know, obviously they're going to play with this and be like, oh, Sarge Rentals. And next time their friends are looking for an apartment or a house, they'll think Sarge Rentals as well, which I think is, uh, is really, really, really smart. Uh, Yaj asked in the, in the chat, um, because lots of events are getting canceled, do you think the stats will change entirely? Uh, will the entire landscape change? I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I think it depends on how long we're not doing events. If we're not doing events for six weeks, that, you know, everything will bounce back to normal. If for whatever reason we're not doing events for eight months, well, then, yeah, we, we may change the way we think about marketing mixes for, for a long time. So I think too, too new to say. Uh, unrelated question, the research Yaz, is, is from the um uh the the report that jason mentioned at the beginning if you missed that part um, you'll see it in the um uh in the replay and we'll also add a link to the report as well for all your attendees cool uh marketing must be relevant must be relevant I, i've been doing this a long time again i'm so old i'm I, you know beer pong wasn't invented when i was in college it tells you how old i am uh but one thing I've discovered in my nearly 30 year career is that all marketers tell themselves the same lie, including me. I do the same thing. I fall into the same trap. You know, Yarby does too. We, we all tell ourselves the same lie, which is this. We say that our customers and prospects are, they're just too busy, man. They're too busy. They got too much going on in their lives to pay attention to our email or our blog post or our social media, or even our direct mail piece. Man, they're just too busy. That's what we tell ourselves. And that is complete and total bullshit. Agreed. It's not, it's not being too busy. When, if somebody tells you, if a prospect tells you that they are too busy to read your proposal or look at your direct mail piece or read your blog post or listen to your podcast or watch your video or frankly tune into your webinar, that's not true. What they really mean but they won't say this because it might hurt your feelings. What they really mean is that what you have delivered is not relevant enough. I know this to be true because when you give a prospect the information that they need and you give it to them in the format they prefer, we talked about formats a moment ago, the time necessary to consume that information magically appears. They will find the time because relevancy is the killer app. If you give people something specific that's tuned to them, they will find the time to consume it. If your marketing isn't working, the first thing you should look at is, are we trying to be too broad? Are we trying to reach too many people? And when you pull in the borders and focus on specificity and relevancy, you'll be shocked in many cases how well that works. And here's an example of just that from Paycor. Yeah, and, and to that point, you know, going back to why events and, and direct mail work so well is that, that that level of personalization becomes super relevant to you, the individual, right? You can meet face-to-face -face in events and direct mail can be highly personalized, like we'll see here with, with Paycor. 
And if you're not familiar with Paycor, they're, they're HR software. They, they provide all the tools HR teams would need. Uh, and these guys are kind of a, you know, a lovely case study for us. They, they were doing a batch and blast model of direct mail. They just kind of, you know, spray it out there. So we helped them go to a more relevant, intelligent, multi-channel campaign. It started out uh, when we built this campaign out at the top of the funnel, they sent out an email that included some topic and pain point specific content to uh, HR professionals. Right. So when, when that person would, would engage with a specific piece of content, that email, like clicking a link and going to, you know, a certain, you know, piece of content that they've syndicated on their site, they were then added to a more relevant nurture stream to, to what they clicked on. So right, after all, it's got to make sense within the context of what they do. Right. So to, to drive that home, what PFL did was we worked with Paycor to create a two part meeting maker kit. All right. And this is where it kind of gets fun. Uh, the first, <clears throat> the first kit included a wine key that you see on the screen there, a, a personalized note card and a thought leadership guide that you also see there. The guide even had a sticky note on top that mentioned what section that particular prospect would be most interested in. And that sticky note could vary based on, you know, what nurture stream that, that prospect found themselves in. So the CTA, or the, the call to action of that mailer, uh, is to book a meeting to learn about how Paycor can help you HR professional. And the kicker here, uh, that personalized note also says that you'll get a bottle of wine to go along with that wine key as a reward for unlocking the true power of HR with Paycor. And the results that they got, staggering. 21% response rate. They had 2 million in revenue. They had a 5X ROI and a 13% conversion rate. And their goal was anywhere from a 5 to 10%. And this one got, got super relevant and super personalized to the HR professional based off where they found themselves in the nurture stream and in that content syndication plan they put together. That's really cool. I love, you know, the one thing that, that you touched on, I want you to reemphasize is the personal note part of it, right? Yeah. So we have the ability with our, with our software to, to allow the sales rep to include a personalized note card to, to that specific prospect, right? Even, even a, a, the step above that is adding that sticky note to it that mentions, you know, what, what section that particular prospect might be more, most interested in because we know based off the software, where they're at in the nurture stream and which content stream they're in. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I love that. It's super, super sophisticated uh, and effective. And uh, I would love one of those wine keys just to... I think I can take care of that. Fantastic. There you go. <laughs> maybe, maybe for the best question too, you could get a book or a wine key. There you go. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm taking this meeting all day long if you're going to send me a bottle of wine to go with that wine key. <laughs> yeah, you got it for sure. For sure. <laughs> to recap, friends, to create conversations with multi channel marketing, your marketing needs to be remarkable, a story worth telling, needs to be rotating, okay? needs to be repeatable, rational, and relevant. Those five R's are the ones that we think you can take a swing at. I, I would say more important now than it even was last week. This is a very timely session as it turns out. Uh, one more example of, of PFL doing amazing things that kind of supports all five of these R's is uh, ArcSan Technologies. This is a, a really cool one. Tell them about it. Yeah, this is another fun one and we'll bring it home with this, this last case study. So ArcSan is, uh, they have a mission to help companies make their apps more secure, which we're all thankful for that. Uh, so their goal here in this particular campaign was to uh, enlighten app providers of the risk that they probably don't know about that are threatening their security. So they're really taking an educational stance and approach here, but they had a big challenge in targeting executives and C-suiters, right? And, and because of that, the high value nature of their products, it was, it was critical for them to have those C-suiters involvement early on. So we worked with ArcSan to create a, a pretty great campaign with these guys. And obviously it was a multi-channel campaign and it started like this, a couple of emails went out and then followed by that, there were two mailers via FedEx to warm up prospects. Now we strategically use FedEx because we have kind of a running joke here that a FedEx box gets 100% open rate, right? Compare that to email open rates and it's pretty dang good. Uh, so that first FedEx envelope that went out was a risk assessment survey, follow suit with what they do. And the second was an analysis, analysis report explaining how easy it is for hackers to gain that info. Again, took an educational thought leadership stance. But the fun part of it that you see here was following those mailers, the C-suiters received an ArcSan branded box. Uh, inside that box was a personalized note card yet again. 
and a small black light flashlight that was used to expose a message. Remember those little decoder <laughs> pins you would get in cereal boxes when you were a kid? Kind of fun and nostalgic like that. Uh, and when you, when you took that out, used the black light flashlight and scanned it over the note card, it said, you miss 100% of the threats you can't see. Super relevant, super engaging. Man, that's so cool. It's a lot of fun. And so thanks to PFL's technology that they were using and how deep we can integrate into a CRM uh, and utilizing FedEx, the FedEx API, we can let you know within 15 minutes when that product is delivered. So the Arxan reps were able to place a perfectly timed follow-up call. And, and they got some pretty quick results very fast. You know, with the first 170 pieces they sent out, they generated four and a half million in new pipeline, 80% of which was brand new business. And on top of that, they got 2x their average deal size. I'm okay with that as well, along with a 30% faster deal velocity, which I think is kind of the, the unspoken champion of what direct mail provides here. We help push those deals through faster and we generate that, that new pipeline that you see there are four and a half million. Yeah, that's extraordinary. Man, what a neat idea too. I love the, the, the sort of black light pen thing. It's super cool. And I want to do that just because. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's, you know, you're talking about creating conversations. That's one, like you get it and you call a bunch of people into your office and be like, hey man, check this out. Look what we just got. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's really neat. I remember correctly, the, the CMO sent us a note and was like, they, they had one of their top prospects that they were going after. Uh, he said, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen from a marketing team. They set up a meeting right away and it kind of resulted in a brand new opportunity for them right out the gate. So they got a ton of fun feedback from their customers and it got them talking about it. Victoria asks, uh, who came up with this idea? Was it PFL or, or uh, Arxan? It, this particular one, I believe it was Arxan. I'm not, I'm not quite sure, to be honest, who came up with this particular campaign. We, we do work a lot with our customers to be able to put together a lot of these fun ideas. We've got a pretty experienced customer success team that works with our clients to generate some ideas and build strategy and really understand your brand and your message to help put the piece together. Yeah, talk about that a little bit, if you would, before we get into uh, questions officially on, on if somebody wants to put together a program like this with PFL, kind of how does that work? Like, what's the process? Sure, I mean, it's, it's really it starts with A, getting in touch with us, <laughs> and B, jumping on a call with our team. We've, we've got, you know, quite the experienced team of account executives and customer success managers that will get on the phone, our solutions architects get on the phone with you before you even become a customer to really help you understand that you have the right resources available, meaning people, uh, resources, finances, and, and the technology, right? So we integrate directly into Salesforce, Marketo, and Oracle. So it starts off with our team understanding what, what technology you bring to the table, who your ideal customer profile is, and how we can best research that and what's going to perform best based off our experiences. And we really strive to offer you the best customer experience possible before even getting set up because we understand that direct mail has real costs associated with it, A, from it being sent, you know, B, from it coming back if it's not correct. So we want to make sure that from the point that your data is correct, that your ICP is correct, and that your product is correct, right? Because you don't want to send everybody maybe this black light flashlight. You want to make sure that they're, they're engaged in some sort of campaign or stream before they send that out. And that's really where we work with you to set those, those campaigns and those triggers up within your Marketo or Salesforce. Yeah, that's really great. Um, question on a related piece uh, from Gretchen who asks, what tips do you have for strong calls to action that can lead to engagement that, that you can measure? So if you get a, a box or any kind of thing from, from PFL, um, how do you actually track ROI against that? What's, what's the CTA? And, and obviously, if we're going to send out some, you know, a black light pen, that's not a $1 direct mail piece. That's a fairly uh, legitimate expenditure on a per piece basis. So, so how do you go about measuring the actual ROI? <clears throat> that's a great question. We have, I mean, there's a couple of different ways we can go about this. You know, one, one way is I, I work with a lot of, our partners, some of those being data providers and data partners and um, attribution reporting partners that can offer their, their solution to plug into your CRM or your automation platform to help you be able to track that in real time right through your CRM. You know, another way we, do, we also take a lot of pride on our side and working closely with you, the, the marketer who's doing these pieces to understand, you know, from the point of cost to send and how much you're sending to help you really track that ROI and, and, and build that out. A lot of these case studies we build out with our 
customers based on the knowledge of what they've sent, how much they've spent, and how much they brought in. And so we'll do a lot of that homework and math for them. But there's also the opportunity to work with someone like an ORM Technologies who provides attribution reporting to plug into your software and, and understand the, the touch points that you know attributed to that closing. I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about it. Would you suggest that clients start with that idea, start with kind of what, what behavior do they want people who receive direct mail to engage in and then build a campaign that creates that behavior? Or is it, hey, we got a cool thing to send, we'll figure out how to track it secondarily? I'm, I, I lost you for a second there. What was the first oh, part of the sorry. question? Well, I, I, think it's, I think it's in which sequence do you think through the sort of ROI path and the calls to action? Is it, we want our customers to call us, what can we send them to make us, to make them call us? Or is it, hey, here's a cool thing we should send and we'll figure out how to track it. Yeah, I mean, we're thinking about ROI out the gate. Like I said, there's real costs associated with this thing. We want you to make sure you get the best response and best results possible. So we don't want you just kind of go out batch and blast and have no idea what's working, what's not working, how to track. So a lot of companies are just sending out, you know, flyers with no personalized URLs on it. So we, we offer anything from the personalized URL all the way down to, you know, the, the dedicated phone number, anything that we need to track to be able to track how people are responding to these pieces. All right. And, and it's, if we're talking about talk triggers, it's, it's kind of what's going to get people talking, what's going to get people to take our phone call because we do a lot of warm up campaigns, right? So if you think about the, the pay core campaign or the time trade campaign, it's about sending these pieces before you even start nurturing them before you even start a BDR calling. So if you've, if you've sent somebody a wine key with a call to action that says, take a book a meeting, I'll send you a bottle of wine. You're going to be more likely to take that call because there's something in it for you something that you may really enjoy. Same thing with the putter and the golf mat. And we've done a few, you know, pieces out of, you know, out of with whiskey as well back in the day. Uh, so we offer a lot of these call to actions that warm up your leads. It's, it's kind of like, you know, allowing you to alleviate the pressure and stress of knowing if they're going to, you know, take your call or not. I think more, more, more times than not, they take the call. And we have probably upwards of the you know, average of 20% response rates to a lot of these campaigns, but it's not unusual for us to see 40, 60, 70% response rates. Yeah, it's 40, you see 40 to 70%? Yeah, we have an average of 20, but it's not unusual to see anywhere from 40 to 70. Yeah, that's incredible. A uh, great question here from Andrew who asks, um, do you recommend changes to the strategy if the end user and the customer are, are different people? So I think what Andrew means there, and Andrew, jump back into the Q&A if I'm misconstruing this, that the person who might receive the, the direct mail piece um, is different than, than the actual end user of the product. Yeah, yeah, we, we do recommend that. And <clears throat> case in point, kind of the, the time trade piece, you know, being able to target different personas within a business. We did the same thing for InsideSales.com where we targeted different personas with their prospects and being able to send different pieces uh, to, to utilize a different strategy piece. Paycor is another great example. They have tons of campaigns running where they target different, different users, different champions with different pieces, right? They're doing some really intelligent multi-channel campaigns that target different people within the company. Because ultimately at the end of the day, what, what direct mail can really do for your company is really engage your brand champion. So the brand champion at your company may not be the one that's using the product, but they may, may be one of the most influential in the company to get your product in the door and utilized. Dexter has a great question here. Um, do, do you think the direct mail piece should always come um, before nurturing or, or sort of in the middle of a nurture sequence or towards the end to kind of push them to make a final decision? Maybe the answer is depends, but, but uh, uh, what do you think in terms of where it, something like this kind of a wowie zowie direct mail piece should be placed? Yeah, I think, I think you're right. It depends, but also I see it work really well in those that understand where it's going to work best in their funnel. Maybe that's through testing or maybe through, you know, just really playing the field a little bit. But a lot of these campaigns you see that we've talked about, they, they started off with some email campaigns, um, then some digital, uh, digital ads going across the web, and then it drops into a direct mail campaign, right? So it's a lot of that um, utilizing multi multiple different uh, channels, 
right? That's the beauty of a multi-channel campaign. It's kind of that brand awareness. How many times can you say we buy golf clubs in how many different places until someone actually comes and sells you a golf club? All right. So if I'm sending you emails, you may not be opening them or reading them, but you may see that it's from me, see who it's from. Uh, you may see a digital ad, <clears throat> may not click on it, but I send you a direct mail piece and all of a sudden there's that brand awareness and that, that brand recognition. So then you're, in, then you're curious and then you've got a FedEx box on your desk that you're 100% likely to open. Yep. I love it. Makes perfect sense. Uh, any other questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we uh, show you a couple of things? Victoria asked if we integrate or do we, can we work offline? Oh, yeah. Good question. Um, I'm going to say it, 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 it works a thousand times better if you integrate and if you use something like Salesforce, uh, Marketo, Oracle. We do have APIs that it just doesn't provide the, the results that it does in integration because you can track, you can measure, you can see, you get the, the FedEx API access, know when that package has been delivered within 15 minutes so you can make a timely follow-up. Uh, you can set tasks for people to follow up it with, with their prospects and that the kit has been sent out. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of benefit and value in integrating into your CRM or map. Yeah, that's great. Um, we will uh, identify some uh, some folks who have asked particularly great questions and uh, send them some books as uh, as as mentioned. Uh, we'll reach out to you via email to get your mailing address if we don't have it. Um, Ilson asked, do you work with HubSpot? Did you answer that? Say, say that again. Uh, Ilson asked, do you work? Yeah, do you have a HubSpot connection? Not at the moment. Okay, unfortunately. For yet. Um, very good. Oh. Uh, one from Hannah I want you to uh, address. Is it recommended to use a personal URL pearl uh, with these direct mail pieces so you can track if they visit the site after receiving it? You might want to just um, uh, kind of describe how personal URLs work for those who are perhaps not familiar. Yeah, we encourage using a personal URL, your personalized URL because it's specific to you, the person, and you can track what you're, what you're clicking on and who's clicking what and how they're engaging with the, <clears throat> the campaign. Right? If, we're, if we're tracking things, you want to know which piece of the content they're engaged in, like Paycor knew. So Paycor knew which content stream they were diving down into and they were able to send relevant pieces based off that. And, you know, if you're doing kind of like what Arxan did here by sending a couple of different pieces at a time, you know what they're, what personalized URL they're, they're utilizing, what they're, what they're going to, to visit and check out. So you can begin to make that direct mail stream and campaign super relevant and super personalized to them and what they're going after. Simon asks, uh, can you ship globally? We, we have a distribution center in Amsterdam. So we've got um, EMEA covered Europe for the time being. We're not sure how that's going to be affected right now with the apocalypse that's going on out there. But we are in the process of working on figuring out APAC and how to ship, you know, throughout Asia. But uh, right now, you know, the States and EMEA, we've got covered. Okay. Uh, Caribbean, does that count as, uh, as the Americas? <laughs> so you going there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, Dexter asked about Caribbean and uh, in Central and South America. Um, good question. I'd have to check in on that and see how the, the shipping is to there. Not, not, not one I've heard of. If, it, if we don't, then I'm happy to uh, personally deliver that myself as soon as yeah. the Spain gets lifted. <laughs> Yarby's going to take the Aruba packages uh, and, uh, and mule them down there himself. Well yeah. done. Fun, 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 the team. fun fact, my dad was a mailman for 35 years. So I have Is that right? Knowledge and the experience of delivering mail. So I think it's hilarious that I'm now the direct mailman. That's Man, a good dad no joke kidding. for you guys out there. Yeah, that is, that is hilarious. I love it. <laughs> um, and there's a few other questions. We will try to uh, address those um, uh, via email or directly at the conclusion of the program. Thanks, you all. Terrific questions. Really appreciate your interest in the in the topic and spending time with us. Uh, there's going to be a, a link in the chat here momentarily uh, that has a really cool case study, uh, not just some of the ones you've seen, but a bunch of other ones that, that talk about how this kind of works, especially if you integrate with uh, a CRM like Marketo, some really great stuff. And I would keep this around as an idea starter, if you will. Um, you'll see the link, it's in the chat right now. Grab that, um, bookmark it, save it, refer back to it. It'll get you pumped up for some new ideas down the road. Uh, Yarby, anything else you want to uh, touch on? I don't think so. I'm happy to be with you guys. Appreciate everybody's involvement and engagement today. I'm gonna drop my 
email address into the chat here. If anybody would like to shoot me an email, have any questions that you would like me to personally answer, um, you can drop me a note. Happy to talk. If not, we'll see you in the funny pages. Yeah, you guys are fantastic. Thanks so much for uh, for having us, and and uh, we appreciate the the interest and the questions. And uh, you guys stay safe out there. We appreciate you. Take care.